I see us on YouTube, but Kristen will give me the uh, thumbs up when we get onto the website. I actually have a message that says we're streaming on YouTube. Perfect. Yeah, we're on the website now too. Okay. Too many tabs in my browser. When two screens are not enough. Four. Gets a little unwieldy. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. I know Harmeet's not coming tonight and um, Is he okay? Yes, yes, just not coming. And I believe Caroline will jump on here in a minute. So we are open at nine this morning today for the first time. And, uh, you know, it's very soft open. So we don't really announce it out. We'll do that on the Thursday's email that goes out this week. We'll put that out a little bit wider. And uh, 901, three people in the building. <laughs> so. How did they know? Was there anything? Hey, people find a way. I think there are probably people who will you know, come to the door and be like, oh, it's 10. I mean, you know, on top of it, it was a very crummy morning. You know, it's not yeah. like they were just out walking. That's funny. Listen, three happy, happily surprised people. I'll take it. So. It wasn't in the latest, because it seems like I get those new, news and note things fairly regularly. Was the, were they always yeah. posted in there? No, no. We do. We do. Uh, we, we have become um, rather enamored of the soft open. And it gives us a little bit of a chance to like get our new patterns established and everything. And then so we'll start on a Monday and then Kristen will put it in her news and notes that comes out on Thursday. So, um, you know, we're just, we'll get it rolling. It gives us time to get the signage fixed because there's always, we always put it someplace that it's wrong. But, yeah. um, you know, there were some people confused this weekend. They thought we were open at, uh, at 10, but we, it was 1030. So now this weekend, it'll all, you know, trying to get Google updated. In any case, everything's going to come back to normal and uh, we'll be all set. There's Caroline. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Okay, um, we can call the meeting to order then. Um, the, the Monday, June 14th, 2021, the trustees meeting officially is called to order. Uh, first order business is public participation. I will check any? really quickly. Nothing. Okay. Okay, we'll go into the review of previous meeting minutes. Everyone get a chance to take a look at those minutes. And just a heads up, there's two of them. There's one for the long range planning meeting. Okay, great. We'll do the trustees meeting first and then the long range planning meeting second. I'll take a motion on, uh, on the trustees meeting. So moved. Second. I'll second. Great, all those, uh, any discussion? All those in favor, raise your five, raise your hand. Any dissension? Okay, those are approved. Now the long range planning meeting minutes. I'll take a motion on those. I moved. Okay, great. Any second? Michelle, yeah. Great. Okay, all in discussion. All in favor, raise your hand. Any, any objection? Okay, those are passed to financial reports. Pages um, 17. Okay. Uh, Currently, we're tracking at about 11% under budget. Um, I'm, I'm projecting, this is just a, a guesstimate, but I'm projecting that we're gonna end the year 
somewhere in the neighborhood of $500,000 in savings, unless there's some really unusual expenses that hit in June, but I, I don't, I think I've got everything. Um, and again, this savings can uh, be used, it, it will increase the fund balance and it can be used for really anything that the trustees, the library decides to use it for, um, potentially setting it aside for future capital projects. Um, I can, I just did a quick back of the envelope calculation to try to figure out what makes up that $500,000 in savings. Um, it's, this is a little bit rough, but uh, I would say that salaries and benefits um, account for about 38% of that. Uh, you know, we had a lot of savings, turnover savings and savings and holding positions open, you know, not filling positions because of the pandemic. Um, we, between operations and capital expenses, we uh, are going to be saving about 45%. Um, if you just, if you look at capital expenditures, that's $105,000 right there that we didn't spend. So that's, you know, that's roughly, that in and of itself is about 20% of uh, the $500,000 in savings. Some savings in library materials, maybe about 17%. Um, next month, we'll, I'll, I'll provide some more detail. It'll be the end of the year. Um, it won't, the numbers won't be audited, but they'll be, you know, pretty close to final numbers. And um, I can provide some more detail uh, so that you can actually see what, you know, what lines did we really have savings in and what lines did we overspend? Um, you know, there should, should be a, a pretty complete picture um, in July for the, for the year end. That would be my goal anyways. Great. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything else on uh, um, the warrants or anything, any of the checks that are, that are listed? Can I ask you, just so from what you said on the, the 500,000, it sounds like, and I guess it makes sense that had the library been open without, if, if COVID hadn't happened, the library had been open between the staffing costs and the operations and maintenance costs, that, that number, that um, that savings number would be significantly lower. Is that correct? So it yes. only stands out mostly because of COVID and because of the staffing savings, well, the savings because of staffing and the savings because of particularly operations. Yes, but typically every year we have savings. Um, we have staffing savings and, and we have some other savings. If I, I've gone back to look over the last few years and we've had, you know, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three hundred thousand dollars each year in savings. You know, for one reason, one thing, we budget for capital expenditures and we haven't been using that money, you know, on a regular basis. The purpose of budgeting for capital expenditures is to be able to try to set aside some portion of the budget for the future. So typically, if, if our budget is really on track, um, we should have, uh, you know, 100 to $125,000 in savings every year in capital expenditures because, you know, unless we've planned for certain expenditures in a particular year. Um, I'll wait till I see if other people have questions on the particular report, but then I might, um, I want to bring up the idea of um, a, um, when and if the board wants to discuss a fund, a capital fund right. that would actually right. be, yeah. Right. Right. The only, comment is really a question at this point. We, um, I think we used to get the detailed expenditure report every month in the board packet and now we're getting it, Sherry, are we getting it like quarterly? We were doing it quarterly, but we can certainly put it in every month if you'd like to see I'm, it. I'm, That's kind of what I'm throwing out. Do, do people want the detail line by line? Because you can see a lot in the line to line detail. It also makes the board packet. Busier. Yeah, the detail happens to be in there this month. It just, right. you know, it got oh, thrown man. in there. I made a mistake. Sorry. No, no it's no big deal. Um, oh. And we could we could hit present it every month. It's not a big deal because we, we have it. It's not like it's something extra that we have to do. So it, it, it just it's, does show uh, certainly in operations and stuff. I went through it more carefully and saw, oh, there's like 20,000 there. There's 30,000 there. Yeah. So it, do, it does add up. It does add up. And right. at the same time, we... Um, we also had less in revenue because we didn't have the fines. So, you know, everything is, everything is pluses and minuses, but certainly more in savings, which is good. 
Is that right. more detailed report is what is you're talking about is on page 12. That's, that's the summary you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's the detail of expenditures. Isn't the issue also that anytime we don't fill a job, like right away or within a certain reasonable time, you accrue savings? I always thought right. that every time we, we, you know, tell Jeff to wait a meeting or something, you get a you get that HR savings benefits in right. seventy piece too. So right, yeah. Yeah, and we're, I mean, we, you know, listen, uh, it is my job to make sure that we're underspent or at, right. or, you know, at least right on or underspent for personnel. And overspending the personnel line is not something that would be a good idea for us to do. Right. Because uh, it's right. our biggest, our biggest lines. But the, um, and, and for the budget extra. for next year, we actually budgeted a, a, a turnover, a, right. a turnover amount. Right. We tried to be really conservative. So we would, <laughs> still have some savings. We went, we don't want to be so close that we, you know, we end up overspending. Right. Um, but we want, we'd like to be a little bit closer to reality. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I like that idea because um, at least when I was on the board, we were budget, we were supposedly budgeting for a zero, like, and, and inevitably ended up with some savings because of re retirement and, and, you know, with called breakage when a new employee came in and an older employee left. Um, and, and I'm not sure there were ever years that we had, a, you know, that much. And that's why that other fund was uh, set up in terms of funneling things off towards capital projects. But um, there, there could be flaw. We might even discuss it as, as a board. The philosophy is, you know, without jeopardizing the library's um, operations, do we budget anticipate with in anticipation of recouping 50, you know, 150,000, $200,000, or are we budgeting closer to what the expense, expenses might uh, cost without jeopardizing the, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't have a position either way, but it's, it's interesting for me to hear that it's like the, that the budget is basically developed so that there is, Roughly an anticipated, you know, up to two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar surplus. Well, I, I'm not sure it's it's anticipating a two or three hundred thousand dollar surplus. I think it's fair to say that we anticipate full employment for our lines. We don't take into account a credit for unfilled positions, and this year we moved to actually do that. That we have taken that into account, as as I understand, Sherry to say in a conservative way as a first step. And <laughs> certainly <laughs> in a concern, well, that was, you know, this is an, an unusual year, but I, I think that's how we would ease it in. Um, so. I, th I think too, the, I hate it to sound like a, bro a broken record, but I think this is the important reason for the long range plan because the board, this is the board telling itself, what is our goal? Where are we looking to go? What are the monies that we anticipate on spending? And then the plan is, then the budgetary plan is derived from that where we say, oh, okay. Um, so in the past, whether it was the parking lot that was um, refreshed back in 2009 or the HVAC plan, it was like, there is a plan for how this money is gonna be spent. And we have a, you know, the, the whole organization is like, oh, at the end of the year, this money's being saved because it goes towards a goal. And that's what makes that whole thing, um, you know, really that long range plan can seem kind of amorphous but it's very important because that's where you know, we're telling ourselves and in the community, listen, yes, there are savings here. The savings are not to, to have money in a pocket. It's ridiculous. Uh, you'd rather have it in the taxpayer's pockets, but it's that you know, there, there are you know, necessary and needed repairs to happen to the library. And this is you know, what we've identified as those highest priorities. Boom. And that's where that money's going. You know? And that's, um, I know the school district, they have different, um, controls on them uh, in ed law, you know, but for us, it's, it's the, the philosophy, the philosophy is, do, are we going to try to save the money and, you know, save it out at the end of the year so we can do some of these projects or, um, you know, some libraries have a philosophy where they bond more often, right? They, they're more often more like a school district where, you know, they're, they're constantly running some sort of bond um, because the, the budget is designed to be at zero. And that's not been our library's philosophy, but it, it can be, and lots of libraries, you know, libraries run the gamut from all that, just like school districts do, so. Well said. Yep. Any other questions anyway. on the update, on Jerry's update? 
Do we need a motion? Do we accept the treasurer's report? Yeah. Yep. I make, Sherry, do you have other points to make? No, not about the uh, report, no. Okay. I make a motion to accept the treasurer's report as presented in the board packet, including the, the uh, warrants for disbursements. I'll second it. Okay, great. We have a motion second. All those, uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carried. Uh, you want to go into the investment presentation? Yeah, just, just okay. before I go into the investment presentation, I just want to mention that um, we've received the engagement letter for our upcoming audit. Okay. And um, this will be the third year working with Marvin and company. Um, the fee is remained flat at fifteen thousand oh seventy five. Um, I'm looking forward to working with them and hoping to be able to provide some efficiencies throughout the process. I'm going to have a call next week to talk about um, some things that that perhaps I can do in, to get a jump start on the audit and um, get some things going and, and make their job a little bit easier. Hopefully, um, so we'll see how that goes. And Sherry, where are we with um, our current RFP results? Is Do we have an option for another year with them without going for an RFP or do we have another year to run? Where are we with the long? We don't, we don't have to do another RFP. If we wanted to stay with Marvin, we could stay with them for 10 years. Okay. Um, this is our third year with the initial agreement. Um, and I think what we can do is have a conversation with them at the end of this year to say, you know, we'd like to continue, um, you know, give us the engagement letter and tell us what the, you know, tell us what you expect the fee to be. And we can, we can talk about that. We can negotiate that a little bit. Um, but, uh, we can continue with Marvin without having to do an RFP. I don't have any problem with that. I think they've done a great job. I just... I would like to know specifically what the terms were when they presented it to us. Cause I think, I think that it was like three years plus an option and it doesn't it change what we do. I would just like to know specifically what those terms were. I believe it was two years with an option. So, if it's, so we are in the option year. Yes, we are in the option year. Okay. That from what I remember, it was um, a two year contract with a one year option to renew. Okay. Okay, so Sherry, I think, I mean, I don't know how any, everybody else feels. I would, I would defer to Sherry and Jeff and Tanya's judgment on it at this point to at least open a discussion and, and see what we would get back from them, from, you know, for a quote from um, the, the auditors. Yeah, I agree. I think that'd be a good way to start. Yeah. Well, would that go to the finance committee first or does it have just come to the whole board? Well, if she has information, it will go to the finance committee. But mm -hmm. at this point, we're discussing it. And I was kind of throwing it out to say, would anybody have an issue if we proceeded yeah. on that path? Because the clock is ticking. If someone felt strongly about an RFP, the clock is definitely ticking very loudly at this point. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, th I think we are where we are. And I have no dissatisfaction with the service that we've gotten. Yeah, I, I, I would say that um, it's not necessarily a good idea to do an RFP every two, three, four years, unless there's a reason to, unless there you know some dissatisfaction or some issues that, that we've had. Um, switching auditors very frequently kind of is a, is a little bit of a red flag. Um, you know, if we did an RFP and we, it showed that we had been switching auditors, you know, every two or three years, that would raise a question. Um, audit firms would wanna know why, what's going on? Why are you doing that? Um, Cause there really isn't a requirement to um, change auditors that frequently. In fact, it's not necessarily very efficient to do that because the first year is a little bit challenging. It's, you know, new people that you're working with and a new firm that needs to, needs to learn about what we do and how we do it. And I would also, adding to that, and I agree with everything you've said, we have stayed with firms for extended periods of time. 
And we've done some switching in the last 10 years, um, just from the perspective of bringing um, new perspective in and, and making a change, which is healthy. Um, Sherry has also pointed out, and I don't think she mentioned it tonight, you can also get fresh perspective by changing who your lead auditor is within a firm right. if, you're, right. if you're satisfied with them. And you know, th there are different ways to achieve, um, to achieve um, safety results. Um, so that said, I think Sherry has a good handle on this. And she's, this is one of the reasons I think that we hired a professional treasurer to, to do some of this and advise us on it. So I'm good with where you're going, Sherry. Okay. All right, yep. and I'll you know, certainly uh, keep you posted and probably have some more information next month about where we are you know, with the audit. We'll be starting to you know, prepare some schedules and get things ready for them. Great. Sounds good. Okay, I guess we can, we can get into the investment um, presentation. Jeff, can you share your screen? Because I, I have it up on a different on a different computer, so. All right, give me one second here. It's not gonna be perfectly filling the screen, but can you guys see that? I'll see if yes. I can increase the yeah. size a little bit. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to put together um, some information about uh, our investment policy. I thought, well, first of all, we're required to review our investment policy every year. But I thought this would be a good time to kind of see where we are um, and give me an opportunity to um, come up with maybe some recommendations going forward. Um, so first, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background on the investment policy. I know, you know, it, it was completely reviewed and overhauled a couple of years ago, um, but particularly for Charmaine, who wasn't here when that was done, um, just a brief overview. Um, so our, our, our primary object, objectives are to conform with applicable federal, state, and legal requirements, to safeguard principle, um, to provide sufficient liquid, liquidity for the library, and obviously to obtain a reasonable rate of return. Um, as far as conforming with um, federal, state, and legal requirements, uh, we have a limited number of investment options available. We can't invest in anything we, we want. Obviously, we don't want to invest in anything that's too risky. Basically, our choices are time deposit accounts, certificates of deposit, and treasury bills. Um, diversification is, is another thing that, that we can take a look at. Um, it can be good to diversify among different institutions, but it's important to find a balance between um, diversifying and keeping the number of accounts to a minimum. With a lot of bank accounts, it can complicate um, effective control of cash, make things a little bit more complicated. Uh, it could result in frequent interbank transactions with fees, um, and it um, can make it more difficult to manage cash and, and to actually get it cash quickly. Um, so my recommendation would be to have a minimum number of bank accounts to, uh, to be consistent with legal and accounting re requirements, but still have, a, you know, have some diversification. And obviously we need to safeguard principal, any investments over $250,000 we have to have security for. Um, TD Bank, Key Bank, and M&T Bank um, provide an irrevocable letter of credit. Uh, NBT Bank uses a pledge of eligible securities as collateral, which is just another, another way of safeguarding the deposits. Uh, providing sufficient liquid, liquidity. Um, obviously, the deposits have to be available for operations. Um, we'd want to make sure that we laddered. If we, if we got involved in CDs and treasuries, we'd want to ladder them by maturity date so um, the funds would be available as, as we needed them. And obviously, obtaining a reasonable rate of return. Right now, the current climate is, is the rates are really low. Everybody knows that. Um, we can't do any better with 
T-bills or CDs than we're already doing with our, our um, time deposit account with TD Bank, which is why we, you know, we're just sticking with that for now. Sherry, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. On the previous slide, I think you used the term ladder and I wanna make sure I understand what you, I think I know what that means, but could you just explain that? Yeah, just, just to, um, in other words, if we had multiple uh, treasury bills, maybe if we had 30 day bills or, or 60 day bills, we'd wanna make sure that, you know, uh, one T bill uh, matures in October, the next one uh, matures in December, the next one maybe in February. So we wouldn't wanna put everything, you know, all, all the uh, additional funds that we have for investment in something that matures in six months because we, we would need the funds sooner than that. So that would be, yeah. Um, so my recommendations are that I should monitor interest rates at least quarterly and report to the, to the board so we know where we are. Um, and then in consultation with the finance committee, take advantage of opportunities in the market as they present themselves. Um, I think our, our two, two opportunities that we could possibly have would be uh, purchasing T-bills. And I would recommend doing that with Key Bank. Um, I've talked with Key Bank and they have a very easy um, process, uh, easy to, to establish an account and fees are, are very low or almost non-existent because they have a, you know, Key Bank Capital Markets is, is, is the entity that they use to purchase T-bills and it's their own institutional broker dealer and they don't charge a custodial fee to hold the investments for us. Um, the other option would be to, um, next slide, Jeff, Thank <laughs> uh, you. To, purchase, to purchase CDs. Um, and again, we can only purchase them through the banks that are authorized by the investment policy. Um, and just, just for a quick review, those banks are TD Bank, Key Bank, m and NBT, and I think Pioneer is in there too. Um, so we currently have accounts with the TD Bank and Key Bank. If we wanted to purchase, purchase a CD with either of those, well, with TD Bank particularly, it would be a very simple matter because we already have uh, a letter of credit. Um, we would just call the bank and say, you know, gee, we'd like to purchase a you know, $500,000 CD. Um, if we were to do something with Key Bank, we would need collateralization in place first if we purchase something greater than $250,000. Um, for M&T Bank and NBT Bank, uh, we've already, we have paperwork in, uh, that has been reviewed by our attorney to, to establish the accounts, but we haven't established the accounts yet, obviously. Um, we could go forward and establish an account if the, their rates happen to be really good and we wanted to take advantage. Um, if we purchased CDs greater than $250,000, we would have to uh, have collateralization in place first before we did that. Um, so I think decisions would be made based on uh, a variety of factors. Um, the best rate available, uh, net of any costs, of course, uh, the ease with which to establish an account and the ability to maintain effective control of cash. And this is just comic relief. <laughs> I didn't do too bad there, Sherry. That was great, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions? Yeah, I, I do have one question. On the purchasing of CDs, um, is, the, is the rate, I mean, is the difference that much more? Or is, is it worth doing that every once in a while? You know, just because you can, you, we do have money like that we can, um, afford not to use for operations for a while. I mean, right. the question is, does it make any sense to do that, uh, you know, at least to try that for a while? Or is it, is the paperwork and everything else so extensive that it doesn't make any sense? Well, I think it would depend on which bank um, we, we'd want to purchase the CD from because, you know, if we, if we were going to go with a bank that we ha haven't established an account yet, we would have to fill out the paperwork and get going with it. I, and I don't think that's a big deal. I just think it would take a little bit more time. Um, yeah. You know, purchasing a CD through TD Bank would obviously be the easiest thing because we are, you know, we're already a customer and it would just be a question of transferring funds from our operating account to a, open up a CD. 
Um, right, but it looks like the interest rates like a third or something. Yeah, the interest rates are so so Horrible. low yeah. that it just right. doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, if you know, if they move in a good direction and you know, there's an opportunity. I mean, there are some CDs out there that um, with you know online banks and and other other places that um, are paying a better rate, but we aren't authorized to do business right. with those with those yeah. banks. Yeah. And the difference, you know, you're not going to get that much money in the difference, really. So that's right. That's right. The question is, it's you know, at some point, you know, he'll be watching it, but at some point, we should maybe just do it, so, uh, you know, to have the ability to do it to try it once, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sure. that when you need, if you want to do it, you can. If the process is all worked out. I do want to make sure everybody kind of considers. Um, one point of this analysis, which is, I think TD structures their money market rate for us. That's a special rate. Okay. That's not a normal client rate. That's a rate that Robert got when he went in and said, okay, we're going to start looking around and bidding. And they were like, whoa, we're going to up your standard rate. I think um, that we need to be cognizant of that. We're lucky about that. But um, we may need to make decisions at some point if diversification is that important to us to sacrifice rate maybe to put money in other banks. Because I think, T I think TD has um, incurred an expense for what, are, what do we have with them? A letter of credit or a, a line of credit or whatever? Collab yes, whatever it, it's it's a they have incurred an expense for that. So from a business perspective, they're gonna want us to keep the cash in the bank. Right. I'm right. not saying this to be argumentative or anything, but it will be interesting to see how this plays out. Right. Um, and we're but just as Mark says, we could, you know, we could take two hundred and fifty thousand and buy a CD or or a treasury bill somewhere, and just to try it and see how it works. I mean, I don't think two hundred fifty thousand would affect TD very much if you know we pulled that much out out of out of our accounts with TD. And you know we're we're starting to develop a relationship with them. We met with the a relationship manager, and I like that. You know, you've got someone that you can just pick up the phone and call and say, "Hey, you know, this is what we're thinking about doing. What can you do for us?" Right. Unmute myself. Am I um, understanding correctly that uh, if we did take two hundred fifty thousand from TD and put it into a CD? where we would lose about $25,000 because we're going to lose that 10%. We would only gain, I'm sorry, we would only gain the 0 0.05 going to the CD and we're getting 0 0.15. Right. From, That's right. Okay, so it wouldn't be 25,000, but it would be a, a significant. It, it, it would be loss. a little bit of a loss, but the rates are so low that Right, and I'm thinking about once the rates start kicking up, because I think yeah. they're going to start kicking up, you know, at some point. So when it becomes close or, you know, um, or the same, you know, but, uh, I, you know, it doesn't, it's not a big deal. I just want to make sure that if we, if we need to move, we're ready to move, you know. Right. And, and, I, and I think, I think we can be, I don't think it's, it's. Um, okay. That's fine. Process. I mean, there might be a little bit of time involved, you know, getting signatures. Yeah and that kind of thing. But I don't think it would be, even with the banks that we don't have accounts with, it would take longer because we'd have to set up the accounts and get the paperwork signed up. Maybe, you know, maybe it would take a few weeks, but um, I don't think it would be um, terribly difficult. Okay, that's fine. I think that's the whole reason that, that um, Sherry and I talked about doing this presentation was to bring right. the board up to speed, what our options are, what the investment policy is, refresh our memories and and um, make sure we were all understood it and we're on the same page. So that's right. where we are. Yep. yep. No, very helpful. Yeah. For my part, I'm just happy that, uh, cause we've had some questions about, you know, where, what we can invest in, where we should be investing. Sherry's going to report to the board quarterly. And I think that's great that she's watching that. So that makes me very happy. No, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the information and um, also bringing me up to speed a bit. Sure. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions for Sherry on that? Comments? Okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate your time on that.
Um, and that's very helpful for the record too as well. Okay, we'll move on to the personnel report. Okay. Um, yep, as you see on page 28, the actions requested, requested there are two. There's, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, two positions that are open. One was an internal hire. We had an internal promotion um, for a librarian too, who's one of our new supervising librarians who's replacing um, Gordon who has retired. And then um, we had a resignation of a part-time library clerk. So as we're getting ready to open up our full hours, we're getting closer and closer. Just even today, we are opening at nine. Um, we're going to need our positions back. So, um, so I'd like permission to fill these positions. Okay. I make a motion. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Any, any questions for Jeff or motions? I make a motion to accept the personnel report as presented on page 28 of the board packet. I'll second. Okay, great. Any further discussion? All those uh, favor signify by raising your hand. Uh, any, uh, anyone oppose or abstain? Motion carries. Okay. Now, can, I, can I just say, as you move to your director's report, could you just check your microphone positioning a little bit. All right. Thank you. Sure. How's that? Is that better for better. you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Better, yeah. All righty. So we'll roll right into um, to my director's report. I'll move along quickly for y'all. We um, just, there are several projects. They're kind of minor, small projects that we're hanging out right now. I keep reporting on them, like, you know, uh, removing the tree. And it's just, I think everybody in the construction trades and industry is just so busy right now. We're having trouble a little bit getting people to come in. And then when it comes time to get those quotes, um, people are just really busy right now. So it's not even about the prices being so high uh, for, for metal and wood, which is absolutely true. Uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of those increasing expenses. We're, we're just having trouble even getting some attention uh, to work on that. So I want you to know I'm still working on that, um, that awning piece uh, to help protect the folks that are gonna be doing curbside. Because in the back of my mind, January uh, 2022 is right around the corner and I'd like to have something in that in place for, you know, we'll still be running curbs at that point. So uh, I wished, I had hoped to be a little further along on this. Uh, Kevin is working hard to make sure we're getting attention from the, from the contractors so that we can get that put together. I'm just, um, things are uh, taking a little bit longer than would make me happy. So I just wanted to bring that up as a point. Um, if I'm reporting on something and it doesn't happen, uh, there were, we're experiencing some significant delays as far as that's concerned. Um, we did uh, from the public services side, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Our, our outdoor programming is imminent. Uh, you know, last week we were going to have some, of course, we had some thunderstorms. That was not awesome. But uh, we did start the pop-up library back out that, uh, last week, did some brisk business out there before that had to get shut down by a thunderstorm. And uh, that is the other thing is now that the library is really open for people to come in and pick their stuff up. If there's lightning outside, uh, I'm really going to be pretty proactive in shutting down curbside um, to keep the staff safe. You know, we were uh, last summer, it was certainly uh, storm season. We were pushing that maybe a little bit further along. Uh, some of us who were willing would, would jump out there and do that. I'm just going to pull back from that a little bit. If there's lightning in the area and thunderstorms, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be shutting it down. I think the patrons who have been there seem pretty understanding. Um, I just, it's, it's not worth, you know, when someone can come in if they want to, it's not, you know, it's not worth sending our folks out there um, when, the, when the storms are close. Are you talking suspending it or shutting it down? So like, you know, uh, if, if, if you have lightning in the middle of a shift, are you going to just take right. the off or are you going to like? Uh, no, I think we would come back depending. Uh, they tend to roll through, you know, it's going till yeah. 7 p.m. So they tend to roll through in the afternoon. And when I'm, I'm it's always at five o'clock when I'm trying to make my decision as we're getting right. ready to go. I don't want to leave the evening people with this decision. It's easier uh, if I make the call. And then if it's, you know, five to six, we'll shut it for the evening. But if it was okay. more like one o'clock in the afternoon, we'll open it back up as soon as it's safe. So Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. People can call us and, uh, you know, people can call us if, if they have questions about that. It might are. be helpful with Jeff to have a couple of signs made up just saying, you know, a curbside 
canceled due to severe weather or something too. So yep, we got one. We pop it right out there. So it's uh, it's not big enough, but you're right. I think we probably need to get a bigger sign. Kristen, I can see is taking a note right now. So we'll get a we'll get a nice big sign. Uh, so many signs this year. Talk about one of the over uh, over over expenditures this year: the sign budget. Uh, lots and lots of signs. So um, so that's good. But it's just nice to see that the in person programming. Um, the outside in-person programming is just is just starting to gear up, and you know we will continue that pop-up library. There are still folks who aren't um, super comfortable coming into the building yet. You know everybody's got uh, to do what they want to do at their own pace. But people were very very pleased to see us at the um, farmers market, and um, you know and 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 so we will be doing more of that outreach to make sure that people are there. And some people don't even know we're open. You know I'm like we've been open since last September, so. Um, you know, we just have to get that message out in as many places where uh, you know meet people where they are so they can get that message and they know they can return to the library. Um, wanted to talk, I just, uh, I, I wanted to put a special thank you out to our temporary librarians who came in right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously, I, you know, I think I've sung the praises of the staff, the whole staff and, and how uh, gamely they've uh, ro- risen to the challenge over the past year. Uh, just specifically here, as these two positions are, uh, you know, sort of coming to their uh, natural conclusions as we, you know, when we get back up to full staff on the public services side, which we still haven't gotten to yet. Um, just uh, wanted to thank them, uh, you know, and, and they, you know, there's been opportunities and, and, you know, moving off to other opportunities, which I'm happy to see, but I just really, they helped us get through um, covering those weekend shifts and just being a few more bodies to fill in when we had lots of gaps in the schedule for all sorts of reasons. So they really did help us through there. I just wanted to mention that specifically and mention, you know, thank you to you for allowing me to, to hire those two positions when things were so chaotic. So just, um, that's all. Uh, Friends book sale was successful. They raised over $2,000 in three hours. Um, that was completely done with library discards. We, they did not have the wherewithal, the, the capacity to do an acceptance of donated books. This was, this was done with the, with the library's books and they, um, they, were, they had a very successful time. And people were, again, happy to see something that they could come to and participate in out on the, out on the plaza. If you hear a complaint about the printing software, we know uh, we have been banging our heads against the wall and finally we have decided to just cut the current software that we have off right now there's four stations in the library each one of them has their own printer i feel like i'm back in uh, you know 1993 with this um we're investigating another software but it, what it means is that our remote printing which people actually love to print from home and then come in and pick up that device that is very sketchy right now we're running the old system but it just doesn't seem to be um to be working well we're investigating some new softwares and we'll be um bringing that up uh bringing that in as fast as we can but you know it's it's a switch to a whole different company so uh it's an important uh function you know um wireless printing printing in the in the building and then remote printing is incredibly important i can't stress enough how it what an important service this is to the community and uh when our software that we've counted on for the past i think a decade um really has just gone belly up it's uh it's frustrating for us so we're um, you know, we'll investigate that. We'll get something good. There are some good options. I don't know what those expenses are. Um, if they're significantly expensive, I'll come back here and we'll be talking about the, uh, talking about them in, in a future month. Um, lots of amazing programs again this month. It's this last, uh, you know, what we're reporting on is sort of the last month of a primarily um, virtual programming, but just, uh, uh, just praise again to the public services staff. Um, for doing some great work. The new story walk, we have one on the property at the library. Another one um, we're going to have, um, uh, putting out another one uh, in conjunction with the Mohawk Hudson Land Conservancy. So anytime we can do those partnerships, I just think it's great for us to to work with the other groups and get um, get those outdoor programs. Because again, you know, kids uh, are, you know, under 12 are unable to be vaccinated. So there's a lot of uh, push for outdoor programming for kids this year. And, and, and we'll be participating in that as well. So um, we've begun our summer reading program. We're meeting with the schools, uh, do, doing our virtual meetings and getting the summer reading program pushed out for this summer. I think it's gonna be very important. There's been a lot of slide just everywhere. Um, you know, just the world has been a complicated place and I think we can um, play a significant role in, in uh, uh, engendering a love of reading um, 
increasing that love of reading across our community. So we'll be working on that this summer. Lots of read it forward books. Those are the books that we buy, uh, give out to the teens and kids, and then they give on to their friends rather than having to come back to the library. So those are very successful with, um, with different populations of people. It's just easier when that book doesn't have to come back always. Um, and then a long, several months ago, this feels like the winter, uh, a leader from a local Brownie troop reached out to me and wanted to do some sort of volunteer project at the library. And at the time, February, I'm not sure, January, it was like, we don't, there's nothing to do right now. We're, we're not doing a, a, a volunteer program. But that um, handed it over to Kathy Brenner, who's in charge of programs and outreach. And they worked back and forth. And they, uh, the Brownie Troop, there's a picture in my board report. They came and did a cleanup project and uh, some installation of um, some uh, extra decorations, some fairy doors um, out on the, um, the memorial patio space that's outside, outside the children's room so it was just good to see them um we were able to bring that um bring that to conclusion because we've been talking about that for a while the uh, we talked a little bit by email about um about the, the elimination of the quarantine and then how we move from the shed back to our traditional book drops that's um we're all in preparation for that I've got some quotes on uh, new book returns. We're investigating some other alternatives as far as um, making that book return bigger. And of course, the book return has to be larger right now because we're not accepting returns inside. When that happens, some of that will be ameliorated, but we still would like as big a book drop as we can have outside. So that cost remains about $10,000. It seems extravagant, but that's uh, just sort of the prices for those. So um, I'll be putting that in front of you uh, imminently. I just have to get uh, the appropriate number of quotes to be able to put that together. We have one that we've identified that I think um, will work well for us and uh, has a much bigger capacity than our current one. So. Um, Jeff, can I just ask a quick question about the returns? Yeah. Is, 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 is there a reason why you wouldn't just keep the, one of the sheds out there? Well, right now we're, I, we could, right? So uh, we, we have investigated getting a pad board where the old outside book drop is so that could sort of could accommodate a shed because right now that 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 ground is not level it needs to be bigger so that we can put one of the sheds there. We want to get it out of the parking lot as more people want to park in those spots where we didn't have to worry about that. Now people want to park there. I want to move that shed over. That's one of the contractors I'm having trouble getting. I'm like, just come and pour me a pad. I will put the shed here and, and that will be our good. I want to, I, that's, the, that's my ideal thing. That would buy us some time to make a decision um, about the, our ideal book drop. But it's just, I'm, I'm frustrated at every turn to try to make this work. I mean, what we're doing is okay, but I'd like to bring that closer um, back in and have that. Um, so sometimes people turn on the inside, turn around and then they miss where the book drop is and they get all confused and they pull over to the side. It's just causing uh, a fair amount of chaos as people who maybe haven't participated in the library in the past year at all are coming in and, and largely it's kind of normal operations, but some things are still abnormal and it's just growing pains as we sort of get everything back to normal. But um, that's what I want. That's my stated goal. I'm just having, I'm frustrated in getting us there. Um, so we'll leave it where it is for now but it's going to have to, we, we need a solution and it may just be, you know. Jeff, I just wondered um, if there's no longer a quarantine, is there still a cleaning process involved? Is that why everything has to be outside and none of it can come in? No, and people can bring in. So we have a cart right by the, um, there's a cart right by the front door where people can bring in books or anything that we were originally using for library return things that may be like you shouldn't put something, a super delicate piece of Chromebook into that outside book drop. Um, people are bringing it in and returning books inside. So people like an app, we don't send people back outside to, to return things. It's a lot of steps out there. Um, there are some distancing issues back behind the circulation desk. So it's why we're not using that drop slot right now, but we're, it's, you'll see in our quarantine plan, it's, it's, it's imminent. So we'll take that off and people will start to use that um, again shortly. We're like everybody else, waiting for the 70%. So uh, those social distancing guidelines can be, because that's a, 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 when that book slot is open and the staff is using that to do the returns live, it's a real concentrator of people and we're trying to not do that right now. So that's why we're, that's the primary reason we're not using that indoor uh, book slot. And it's why we have a wagon right by the front door where people can come in and drop their stuff. So 
So it kind of sounds like this will only be an issue for a very short time. Correct. And in any case, the old outside metal book drop is literally rotting away. The lock doesn't work and it has to go. So I'm, you know, but I, you know, it, we haven't ordered it yet. It's going to be however long it takes to get those metal things fabricated and shipped to us. I'd love to think it's an off the shelf item, but I don't think it is. And so I'm trying to find a decent interim space for, so we can open up that outside book drop. And it just, it's not coming together as I wish it would. So I apologize for that, but we're um, daily and actively working on this. So we'll, we'll get there. I think again, it's three months from now, we'll all look back and maybe I'll find it in myself to laugh about it. But. <laughs> Not right now, but thank you. Good questions. That's uh, that's where we are. And the new cash register is up and running. Um, we're accepting right now. We're accepting money, uh, credit card transactions mostly, but some cash for uh, lost materials. And everybody's getting their cards cleaned up and uh, in preparation for that July one, when the fines are going to turn back on. And we've got that process um, essentially established and we're ready to go. So we're already using it. I was the guinea pig. I uh, let my credit card be the guinea pig and it worked very well. Catherine and, and Sylvia took care of me and uh, the credit tra card transaction went right through. So um, mobile app, we're just gonna, we're getting a new mobile app. And I think the a key feature of this mobile app is that people will be able to on their phone, uh, check out, they have their barcode in the phone and they can scan the barcode on the back of the item and be able to check out right there without having to come to the circulation desk or even to the checkout Charlie or any of the internal self checks. So uh, I don't want to announce that out too widely until I see it, but um, I, and uh, we have one of our IT staff are on this beta test. As soon as I get any information, I'm going to get my hands on it and get looking at it so we can tell what it looks like. But that seems to be other than all the other stuff that the regular app does. This seems to be the one key feature that uh, makes it different than the app that we've had in the past, except for that it's supposed to work. Too, which is nice. And then uh, just a bunch of continuing education. On page 33, we'll look really quickly at the statistics. Um, I think the, the most important thing is that you look at the circulation statistics, the year over year growth looks great. Obviously, uh, you can imagine May. Uh, um, so we're in June now. This is May of last year we're reporting on. So uh, the increases are uh, significant. Last year was still primarily physical circulation and now we have physical and, um, and digital circulation. So um, some nice increases in circulation, some uh, quite mathematically uh, accurate, but totally bizarre increases in the uh, borrowed from other and loaned to other, uh, you know, a, a 46,000% increase fantastic, uh, unsustainable in the long term, just uh, because it compared it to a number that was non-zero, but pretty close to zero last year. And then, um, you know, some, some good uh, increases for e-audiobook use, decreases in other uh, electronic use. So I just think that's, um, if you look at the bottom on page 33, from e-book to streaming video, you'll see almost every category of electronic use compared to last May, dropped as you might expect, because we're not under where we were last May, but e-audio continues to see some significant gains. And that's just a shift away from CD audiobooks to downloadable audiobooks. And that is never going to change back. So um, that those audio CDs are, we'll continue to buy them, but obviously they're going to be uh, an increasingly less relevant collection as we move forward. So it's just, you're, you can watch that happen live um, as you look at the statistics right now and um, some good bumps in wireless use. You can see um, uh, electric use is normal enough. Um, and yeah, I talked about all of the, uh, the electronic use again. So uh, we still see increases compared to where, where we were pre-pandemic, but uh, decreases from when we were in the height of the pandemic and uh, electronic only, you're not even doing really curbside pickup. So physical circulation is still um, still the majority, and we expect that to continue, but those those uh, trends will move on in a, in a post-pandemic world. So we'll keep tracking them. Questions for me? All right. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, UHLS report? Well, 
last week was the annual celebration and I did send you a link to the presentation if you weren't able to make it I encourage you to watch it. The um, program awards if you didn't hear about that the youth and family went to Voorheesville and the adults went to Ravina Corman Selkirk. Um, a lot of um, options to choose from. So um, one thing I will say, we haven't gotten our um, bids out, you know, for construction grants yet, but I wonder, as you were talking about it, Jeff, whether there will be some impact because of, you know, the shortages and costs seen there. So it'll be interesting to see how that works. I think, you know, without a doubt, all construction is just really... Mm -hmm. really expensive and then you know there's some timeline questions about can you right. get can you get those done in the you know two years i'm sure you can get it done exactly. but you know that, that flexibility is not there right now so that's it for me okay great any questions okay under new business uh, i don't know jeff maybe can you can put the policies up on the screen we can do that Quick. Give me okay. a second. There are two policies that we want to vote on tonight, the investment policy and the community participation library board meetings policy. Um, the investment policy is been through committee structure and it's really a tweak, more of a tweaking. Um, I don't know if Sherry, you want to say something about it? Yeah, there, there were just a, a couple of minor things that I thought would be worthwhile to uh, add. Okay. One is, you know, to state right in the investment policy that um, investment reports will be furnished to the board of trustees on a monthly basis. And the other is just a wording uh, tweak. I think we need to say um, the maximum amount which may be kept on deposit at any time rather yeah. than which must be kept on deposit. So it's just a correction there. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions on those tweaks? Okay, I'll take a motion then on the investment policy changes. So moved. Charmaine, second. I'll second. No line. Okay. Any other further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand. Okay, any abstentions or denials? Okay, motion carried. The next one's uh, community participation and library board meetings policy. There's a lot of red in this, but there's not a lot of change, I don't think, from a philosophical point of view. Right. I think it was important. Uh, the policy committee uh, felt particularly important that we change from sort of citizen to community member. So that's a, a lot of the changes throughout this as we, you know, just change the wording of you know, what, what we're talking about here. Yep. Um, there's also a substantive change to allow for a 30 minute maximum public participation at the end of the board meeting, not just 15 minutes, 30 and 30 um, for those two maximum periods, but also giving the board president um, the the ability to adjust that. If there's, if there's one person who wants to come in and talk and um, you know we're, we're having a lively discussion, it gives the board president the ability to, to make that adjustment. So that's in there. And then, um, and just some clarity about how uh, community members can, can direct specific inquiries. Many of them come right to me. And then if it's too thorny for me or they're not happy with my decision, they come to the board. People can obviously come directly to the board if they wish to, but it just lays out um, if someone comes to me and they don't find a satisfactory answer, um, how they can correspond with the board and that the correspondence received will be shared among the board members. So as we get ready to contemplate in-person board meetings. I think this was a, an important policy to look at yeah. and, uh, and bring back up just to, to make sure. I mean, just refreshing policy is a good idea anyway. Yep, no, thanks. Any, it's been through the committee structure too as well. Any questions or concerns about this policy change? I just wanted to note, I wonder why we're putting in the policy that it has to be in writing rather than send it to the email address or maybe add the email address. Got it. Um, yeah. Just a yeah. thought. Yeah. Okay. Well, let you know, let, we, there's a web page because we don't, um, right. a web page rather than a specific address. You know what? That's a really good idea. It would be a, uh, super easy to add that web Can page. Can we make it an email address? I don't know. I would, I would also add to that. I, I know when I was president, there were one or two things that like I had to like trek over to get it. It was inconvenient. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, as a former president, I would prefer to have it by email, and that would yeah. make it easier for the for the mm -hmm. for the president. But that's just mm -hmm. one perspective. So we can make it. I mean, I'm okay with that tweak. That makes that makes total sense. Okay. I mean, you might still have people that want to write a letter, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we certainly do, and I, I don't think cutting them off from that, but I, but you know, well taken that uh, we can have that option in there, um, and uh, we can add that in. I, I hate to put an actual email address in there because every once in a while it gets so spammed over we have to change right. that particular email address. So we'll you know we'll put that link that link to the email yeah, um, should be relatively stable. If we have to change it, we'll come back and tweak the policy. So yeah. okay, no, that sounds good. With that tweak, is everyone okay with this or any questions, discussions? Okay, I'll take a motion for that change. I'll make a motion. Okay, Lisa, a second. Mary, great. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, any opposed or abstentions? Nope, motion's carried. Okay, um, updates to phase reopening plan. Uh, so do you want me to share out that? Uh, that yeah. the opening plan is that e the easiest thing to do? Okay, give me one second. Oh, this is good. Best. I'll take a look at that right now. So let me roll down. Basically, you know, phase point five and one, this is all in the past for most of us uh, and will stay in the past if I have anything to say about it. Uh, I hope the world agrees with me. Um, uh, then we'll look at uh, phase five, which is where I believe we are. You know, the, the lines between these phases get a little buzzed out. But um, this is this is where we we are. Um, this continued process towards normalization, and I just wanted to to go through uh, what we're doing and make sure you're aware of it, and and make sure I have your approval. So um, regular hours will continue. We are back to that as of today, with the exception of uh, Friday nights, which I uh, you saw from the personnel report. We still have a bunch of positions to hire to be able, we've, we've stole those people shamelessly to, to move them around. So we have a bunch of positions open and a number of them are on Friday. So we're, we're in progress with that. So that's just uh, you know, putting that down there in writing. We'll continue with the no, toy, no toys in the children's area. Um, we will have signs about, you know, an education role about um, hand rubbing, hand washing, you know, making sure you make those, you know, you can sanitize, but we're not gonna be um, saying you must or, or you have to, we'll make them available for people. Um, we will, uh, in accordance with the New York state guidelines, which is what they, you know, the guidance right now is that, uh, indoor spaces where vaccination status is unknown as the library, um, masks are encouraged, uh, for all across the state. Um, so we will continue to do that too, but we're not requiring it or chasing people down. Um, they are by taking their mask off, attesting to the fact that they are vaccinated, fully vaccinated before they do that. Staff members, um, I want to put in here as of July 1st, inside the library, uh, staff members who demonstrate that they are fully vaccinated through a couple means of proof, either the New York State passport or showing their vax card, um, after July 1st will have the uh, choice to be able to remove their mask inside the library um, at that time. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're moving past a time you know, I, I keep using local stores as my indicator, and a number of them, the the staff in the, in those places are not are not wearing masks. And again, we'll um, we'll check for that. Absent uh, guidance from the state, which I'm expecting anyway, but that's my plan as of Ju July one. We'll beginning we'll begin to implement that. Um, Mass will not be required for staff or patrons outdoors. That guidance was also updated by the state. We, you know, we had tried to decide how we were going to handle mass at outdoor programs. And what the state has said is that the chance of transmission at outdoors events uh, in anything but the absolutely most concentrated um, events is just so low that it's really uh, not something that we have to be enforcing. And that's um, in this plan as well. No quarantine for return items, indoor book drops not used, but we're, we're right on uh, doing that. And then uh, again, that's uh, waiting for those social distancing staff, social distancing guidelines to be updated, uh, which will allow us to get a little bit back to normal. So that looks more like phase six. Um, the work from home shifts are at the needs of the library only for if someone is placed under actual quarantine, if they've got COVID related uh, childcare needs or uh, there's exposure just for at the needs of the library rather than routinely scheduled at any time. 
um, just moving us back into a, a more normal um, operating procedures. Uh, and then again, we're just waiting for the social distancing guidelines. We will continue to social distance the staff um, in accordance with New York State guidelines. When those are updated, we will uh, we will move forward with that updated guidance. So, we're also planning for some limited, um, maybe some limited indoor programs or limited indoor public meetings. I've been getting some questions uh, from people who want to have some, uh, you know, like a board meeting. Um, back in the library for their community group. And, uh, you know, we're getting to the point where that's going to be fine uh, as we map out how many people can be in the community room at one time under those social distancing guidelines. It's not many, but it's some. And uh, we would like to be able to, to make that open again. But if, the, if New York State, if we get to 70, and if uh, New York State cancels all those restrictions and maybe that we can faster than I anticipate move back into allowing larger groups to meet in the community room. Um, we still have our programs planned uh, essentially for outside because that when we were planning our programs, that was the world we were living in. So we're still moving forward with that. Jeff, do you, I have one question. Do you have the, anyone working in the community room at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, the community room we've cleaned out. So that's, uh, we had, we had people positioned in the community room. We've moved them to the boardroom. And, um, you know, that, those are just anticipation of, you know, if the governor's executive order for our board meetings, what we were no longer allowed to have uh, virtual board meetings, I wanted us to be in a position to be able to do that with really no notice and, and, and no hassle. So we are, um, we are there okay. now. We could, we could be ready to, to, have, to have a meeting in that, in that meeting space. Okay. Um, we'll continue to adjust the number of computers, again, uh, with that social distancing in mind, um, letting the laptops for loan from inside the library, all of those things, those are continue to be um, you know, something we're looking at. We'll return out of system interlibrary loan books. We'll have, uh, you know, Tanya's asked me about uh, having the notary service return to the library. So I think that's a safe thing that we can do. We'll bring that um, during certain hours. And then uh, this question about um, leaving open in-person or hybrid board meetings to resume, that's a question that we'll be discussing in a minute, but I wanted to be that it's um, available to us in this phase um, if we have to do that. And then uh, just wanted to put down explicitly that the curbside service would continue indefinitely is our plan. You know, it's a, it's a, probably the most common question over the past six months. Are you gonna keep doing this? Are you gonna keep doing this? And the answer is yes. So we'll continue to do that curbside pickup um, you know, it is our plan to continue that going forward in, um, you know, we still, it, it's shortened hours compared to the now, how many hours the library is open, but it's, uh, you know, we'll keep those hours and, and keep that curbside going. Uh, just some minor changes to phase six, as I anticipate that uh, moving in, sort of just really coming back to more normal that may trigger or not, depending on what the details are uh, from New York State. Um, and then just uh, some things that when we wrote this plan quite a while ago, just don't seem as pertinent anymore. We're just uh, eliminating those, you know, the asking patrons to sanitize your hands. I don't have to ask anybody to do that. We'll just make the sanitizer available for people to use. And um, that's where we are right now. You have questions for me, I'll stop sharing. Do you have questions for me about the plan? Anything in particular you'd like to discuss? Um, if you agree with this, I, you know, uh, I'd like you to vote on that. Uh, I, I, I don't have a question on the plan. I just have a general question about how many, uh, and I know you probably haven't asked everyone, but do you think the majority of the library staff are fully vaccinated? My feeling is that, yes, I have worked really hard not to ask that question. I've been, you know, it, it, you, yeah. you can you pay attention to the news. You know that either asking or requiring vaccinations is uh, from a political standpoint or just an interpersonal standpoint. It's fraught with some issues. Um, I, I think it's most. Yeah. Most to almost all. But, yeah. um, you know, that's why we'll, uh, but I, you know, there was one of the most common questions I had from the staff was that they would 
be able to continue to wear a mask if they so chose. Yeah. And I really reassured them in the strongest way that I possibly could. I will reiterate it here so that everybody in the public will know. If you see someone in the library that they and they still have their mask on, it does not necessarily mean they're unvaccinated. Uh, we have some um, staff who feel very strongly about continuing to wear their mask, and that will continue to be acceptable. It was acceptable before the quarantine. It will continue to be acceptable after COVID-19. Um, that is a personal choice right. that someone can make. So Jeff, I would reading between the lines of what you just said, I would can I surmise that um, you're sensing no issues with from the staff with these updated uh, changes. I mean, I think uh, our staff are human beings and they have a variety of feelings that go all the way from, uh, you know, this uh, you're, you're being too restrictive with masks to uh, I'd like masks to continue forever. So we're, uh, you know, we, we have to exist in the world as it is. And I think um, it's uh, the staff have been um, very good about uh, following along our rules. At the same time, I you know appreciate from the board that we've been able to move in a graduated way that I had hoped the guidance from the state might do for us, but did not. So we are, um, I think, giving people time, both patrons and staff, to be able to acclimate to the steps as we move forward um, has worked out well for us. So, okay. You know, I, okay, I'll call for a motion then on the changes. So moved. Okay, second. Second. Okay, great. All those in favor, please signify, raise your hand. Okay, great. Any opposed? Abstention? Okay, motion is carried. So those updates are made. Um, you want to talk about in-person or hybrid board meetings? Right. So we're trying to work out technologically, uh, particularly if the governor's executive order um, no longer allows us to have virtual board meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wanted to have a discussion here amongst all of you about well, what you would imagine uh, a board meeting would would be like. Would you be willing to have an in-person board meeting? Is that something that you're actively seeking? Absolutely have no interest in. Um, again, there are some practicalities about having a board meeting. Um, some other uh, some other libraries are, are asking a lot of questions about, you know, masking. Yes, masking. No, is it required? Is it encouraged? Um, you know, what does what do board members do um, with themselves? And it's not a question necessarily that I can answer. The board has to decide for itself. Um, and uh, I just uh, wanted to have those discussions. We're trying to figure out a way that if uh, even if we, if we decided to have in-person board meetings that would still allow for this recording, a live stream to go out to the public um, because we have to have the meeting open in some way, shape or form to the public. And, uh, but without necessarily opening the doors and allowing, uh, you know, uh, an infinite number of people to cram into the community room with us because there are some limits right now on how many people we can have in that room. Um, so being able to have the live stream and also allowing some people to participate remotely if they chose to. Anybody have? So um, what do people think about all that? I am looking forward to being back in the room with people. Um, I think um, I would be in favor of being in a room with people, um, albeit socially distanced. I don't know exactly what the guidelines are now, but it's really none of my business whether everybody else in the room has been vaccinated or not. So for that reason, I would vote for having you know socially distant seating in the room. But I definitely would like to be in the same room with people. Other thoughts on that? And then sure. Michelle, you have muted. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't see everyone all at the same time. Um, I think it's I think it's nice to keep a, a remote option or hybrid option open for a while, um, both for you know COVID reasons and um, you know I think from my perspective I have gotten used to doing everything remotely. Um, I've learned how, kind of a new way of life uh, doing things remotely, and to unlearn that is you know just going to take a little bit of time. That doesn't mean we don't get back. But um, from a personal standpoint, you know, a, a bridge of a hybrid is nice. That doesn't mean that, you know, I wouldn't come in person, but having that option is, I think, very helpful as we all transition back to 
what we once were. Okay. Or some version of that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I I was just going to say that I was in favor of, of meeting in person or like Mary, very much looking forward to meeting in person again. Okay. Lisa or Charmaine, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with in person or and or hybrid. I'm flexible and, you know, looking forward to maybe some day meeting Charmaine in person. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, I, I would love to be in person and I would just leave it up to the library to, to figure out, sorry, to figure out the logistics. It's, it's uh, you know, whatever space, room, seating, tabling is, I'll, I'll show up when you tell me to. Where and I, and totally, where <laughs> I totally support hybrid. I, I did not mean to give any impression that I would ex exclude that. I think it's a great option to allow us that flexibility for whatever works for everybody. All right, so- I also think I, I was just going to say, I also think um, having the, the live stream of the meeting is a good thing to continue with because, you know, I think it gives people more access without having to physically come to a meeting and right. it's, it's great. I mean, it's a good thing for a public library to be doing so. And I, support that. I would just also add that um, if we were going to meet in person and if we were going to be required to wear masks, I would opt for the <laughs> virtual Zoom because I'm hearing impaired and um, actually attempting to hear someone talking behind a mask is, is, is just too difficult for me. No, thanks, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, I, my sense is I, a hybrid option would be the best, at least maybe for the next couple of meetings and then you know, or for, or for the next, you know, a bunch of meetings and then see how that works out. I okay. think we're ready to go in person. I think and, uh, at least a lot of the board members would go in person, but also well, preserve the hybrid. And That's it's positive. pertinent. It's pertinent because the July meeting is where we're expecting to have Paul Mays come and make his presentation. So, um, right. you know, is that basically technologically, I need some time to get that figured out. Is that something you want me to pursue right now? If it is, then I will work on that and get it. Uh, you try to figure out the sound and the and video stream uh, and all that in time for next month's meeting. Yeah, I think I, my sense is, yeah, let's go for it. See if we can, if you can, if, if we can figure it out, great. If not, we'll keep it remote and go to the August meeting. Yeah. You know, uh, I pred is Paul going to come to the library and do the presentation or is he going to do remote in? I mean, I think that's exactly my, question. my next step after this question. So I'm going to go forward with the assumption that we're going to ask him to come to the library for the July okay. meeting, have a live stream um, so that board members who are unable to attend can participate um, and then try to make that work in the room. I, I'm always concerned about feedback and audio uh, issues right. in the room. So we will, um, I, I will work on that and you'll get my updates throughout the month. Okay, and then you know the the default would be we just keep it remote for July if we can't pull it off, and then yep. we can start in August. But I mean, you know, if if we can pull it off a hyper meeting, that'd be that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask, having never been to a live board meeting, did, are there table mics for individual members? Uh, probably no. we have never had that because we haven't typically filmed the board meetings until now, until the until Zoom. So if we're going to do that, we may well end up having to do that exact thing to make the audio work out properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, well, well, much like Michelle, I have um, some level of hearing loss. And so I might need the mics. Just if, if a room is fairly large, um, I, I'm, um, amplification is going to help me. Okay. Mary? Um, just two comments. Um, if we are going to perhaps... Uh, be in person in July. What does that mean for public participation? Does that mean we are automatically opening up the doors and you know, how will we limit it if, if people want to come? The second thing is um, optics of our board, me board meeting meeting in person in July and how close are we to opening the doors for other local board groups to meet right. in our room? Right. And that's what and I was thinking. Yeah, that's a good. There's point. a lot. Yeah, that we're waiting for the 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 guidance from New York State, uh, and of course, there is no meeting more important to the library than the board meeting. As much as I love our community groups, the fact of the matter is, if we're the experiment on that, that is okay. 
Um, so I, I'm very aware of the optics. And I'm also very aware, believe me, I'm getting the calls, not daily, but frequently emails from our public that they are interested in returning to those, um, to those uh, you know, in-person meetings, making those rooms available. Uh, me too, as uh, you know, right now, the, you know, the story hour room and the boardroom, I have staff there because we have to have the staff uh, moved away from each other for social distancing guidance. There's just a lot of pieces that have to go in place before I can sort of say, oh, it's, it's operations as normal. And I have a feeling that I'm going to get a message from the state that just says, oh, it's operations as normal. And I'm going to need a little bit of time to get that in place to put that together. It's not bad if the board meeting is our, our first experiment in that. Do we also have to factor in operations as normal with different um, room limits, number of participants that we want in a room compared to pre-COVID? I mean, well, that's the that's exactly the question that I do not have the answer to is what yeah. will be those capacity limits in the spaces? Uh, I don't know right now. And then your other question, which is, does it automatically mean we have to open the doors to public participation? No. Again, as long as we're live streaming so the public can participate through this forum or in an acceptable video forum, they can watch what's going on in the room. They can be, um, you know, we can, we can continue to do the email public participation or figure out another way to do public participation. That's, um, I've asked that uh, of the library system and uh, my colleagues from around the state. There's lots of different ways that we can make this work as long as we are uh, live streaming it out for the public to be able to view. Okay, thank you. All right, that's that's a good action plan for me. Thank you for that. I appreciate the discussion. It's important, okay. uh, you know. As we, you know, it, like I keep saying, these are good problems to have. I'm so delighted that this is, these are the complexities that we have to figure out because it comes from the fact that things are going so well uh, in the world at large. So yeah. Okay, that's great. So uh, next we'll talk about another interesting societal issue, cyber liability. Liability sure. pause, right? Yeah. So I know we brought this up again uh, last year. Um, yeah. Listen, this is, uh, this is a thing that happens all the time um, where you know, you're hearing about it in the news where people are being held up for ransomware. Uh, we do not currently have a cyber liability and uh, you know, um, ransomware protection policy uh, for the library. There are some structural advantages that the library has that make our data a little less susceptible to this because we're, so, we're sort of distributed in our domains, but uh, it would be hubris to say that that makes us uh, not a target for attack. One of our smallest libraries in the system was held up for um, with ransomware. So, uh, uh, other school districts have been held up. Local school districts, uh, the, the local town was held up last year. So, uh, to think that it can't happen to us, uh, you know, if if the uh, nefarious actors decide to focus their attention on us, they're they're going to get in one way or the other. And there is some data that we are the holders of that I should be um, I, I should really be loath to lose. Uh, again, we're, we, we're doing our backups. We've got, uh, you know, passwords in place uh, and we're, we're working on uh, strengthening those right now. Um, I just, it, it, I want to ask one more time, is this something that the library is interested for the, you know, we have, there's three different tiers. Um, there's a, there's a, a lower level tier and they, you know, they go between 1700 and about $2,500 a year. Is this an insurance that the board is interested in adding to the, um, to the library's insurances right now, or is it um, something that I should um, not pursue? Carolyn? Yep, I supported this last time. I continue to support it this time. And I also think that the world has changed significantly since the last time that uh, we talked about this. You know, as someone who has spent the last several months, uh, I think like a lot of people, honestly, sorting out identity theft issues, um, you know, an unbelievable number of people who I, I know have uh, received, have unemployment claims filed in their name, you know, are receiving mm -hmm. checks for accounts that they did not open, um, all sorts of things. It's just, it's a rampant, it's a much, I think it's just a much more rampant problem than it was even a year ago. Um, you know, and Jeff is talking about something very specific ransom, you know, where, um, so anyway, I supported it last time and I supported it in an even stronger way this time. Yep, Mary. I did not support it last time. I agree, it is a completely different world now. Um, I talk about the fiduciary responsibility that we have to the taxpayers. I think in light of the costs that we're talking about, this is makes m a lot more sense to me now to be considering, and even at the highest tier, it is 
If I were a taxpayer, I would say it's a minimal amount of money and you have it and we should be investing in protecting the, the um, whatever information we have for the employees and the patrons of the library. Doreen? Sorry, um, I'd support it. I would say we're in the in a situation now where if we didn't support it, you would be more likely to be criticized than not. So um, cost is really seems pretty minimal for what it's really buying for us for a lot of reasons. So I support okay. it as well. All right. Um, I would just say that um, I didn't support it last time. And I agree that, that things have changed most notably that two other libraries have been affected. I think that that's a huge indicator of the need for it. However, um, there is a very, it's a large range and we have a small amount of data that needs to be protected, unlike some other libraries. So I'm not so sure that we need the highest um, coverage. Jeff, do you have a, an opinion on that? I, I, I don't have a strong opinion about that. What I was going to say is this is below my purchasing range. So if generally it's uh, acceptable that we're going to have this, let me work with our insurance broker to try to identify, um, you know, what they, I mean, they always want to sell more insurance, but let me try to figure out what some of the other libraries have and I will um, bring it in at, okay. at that range. Well, I, was the highest quote 2,500? 2,500. Yeah. I don't think that's much difference between 70, 1700 and 2500 personally. Well, was it 17? I thought it was 14. Yeah, 1700 versus 25. I mean, I think due diligence, let's look and see, but I, I, would, I would err on the side of being conservative and being protective. That would be my vote. Okay. Jeff, are you, have you had this conversation at the director's meetings? And it's come up. It just came up again at the last month's director's association meeting. And I know um, since the last time we had this, we had this discussion, Upper Hudson did not have the insurance. They absolutely do have the insurance now. And I believe yep. their premium is about $2,500. So um, you know, that seems to be, that, that seems to be about the price for a broad range of size organization. So like the smaller you are, the harder that is um, to, to get to that level. So, I will investigate and I'll let you know um, what we're going to do. Just to be clear, Upper Hudson is one of the entities that um, safeguards some of our data. Yes, and that's the, the great. So They're it's like the, the, pa the, patron, the patron data, much of the patron data, the vast majority of the patron data is not under our control and it's at Upper Hudson. Right. Uh, similarly with the financial data. So that's where you know, we're a little bit different than some other organizations. So that's why you know, it was, it was always a difficult decision to make, you know, you know what data is left. But um, I think with the world as it is, it seems like a good idea for us to, to pursue it. Can I make a recommendation that you just come back next month and just with more specific information and a recommendation so that... You bet. I was just going to add that when it was discussed at Upper Hudson, it was fairly universally endorsed across even, you know, some very small libraries. So... Um, I think like we've all recognized it's really changed in the last year and people have started to see the benefit of, you know, paying attention to this kind of stuff. So I think the hope was that uh, for some of the libraries that went up or Hudson got their policy that that would cover down to the libraries. Unfortunately, it's very clear that it does not. So um, I think that would be a much more expensive policy to cover 29 uh, independent organizations. So. All right, I'll bring that back next month. Okay, thank you. Well, great. All right, hoopla monthly limit increase. Okay, so this uh, came out of a request from uh, from Mary, from one of our board members, who was just asking about the the canopy limits. The, right. These are the you know you have a monthly limit of ten on canopy. Hoopla is five. Um, now canopy is under our control because we uh, subscribe to that separately. But hoopla we subscribe to uh, with the whole of Upper Hudson. Sort of right at the height of the pandemic last March, we got that going. Um, you know, and, and there are certainly libraries that are, have more restrictive policies than us, but we had to come to an average and it was set at five. I think the service is popular and uh, is, I'd like to increase that to 10 for our patrons. I think they um, you know, have a high level of service expectation and uh, not all patrons, but many patrons are running up against that borrowing limit every month. And, uh, you know, this model is uh, for every use that the patrons have we incur an expense per use. 
but um, I, I don't think 10 is an inappropriate number. It's where we set our canopy number. It just wasn't an option available to us last year. I would have recommended setting it higher than five, but uh, you know, when you try to do something system wide, you're gonna get sort of a, a minimum standard. And uh, now that the technology has improved enough where we can stay under that contract with Upper Hudson, but each library can set their numbers at different levels. Uh, I'd like to, to move that up to 10. Um, so that was a well-timed question, Mary, thank you. And uh, I was just pleased that their system had increased in sophistication enough okay. to allow this uh, without having to break off from that Upper Hudson contract. So I wanna make sure that's okay. I, it's, it's, yeah. it's an expense that, uh, right now we're paying about $2,000 a month. We would, exp you know, we're guessing maybe $3,500 a month um, as a high water mark, uh, just, you know, it wouldn't be a doubling but I think there's going to be a you know a steady increase in that amount if we if we let our patrons borrow this. Is and we can data. we can track the data, right? We'll yeah, take, absolutely. Say okay, well. Yeah. Hard know, to take a service away though once we start offering it though. That tends to be no, you know, exactly. Um, yeah, a yeah. squawk inducing. So, uh, but I think it's certainly well, something we can. Is a way to track percentage of uh, patrons that are over five? Uh, we actually, yes. yeah, we do know that, and and uh, Catherine has a lot of that data available through. Okay, her as long as we can and, track um, it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I'm totally supportive of it. Yeah, definitely. Interesting we're only we only pay for services that are being used. Correct. This right? is this, this yeah, is yeah. a this is a, this is why this model is nice. You know, with OverDrive, which is our biggest source, um, it has a wider catalog, but people have to go on a hold list for something on Hoopla. If the title is there, you can borrow it instantly as long as you have borrows left under your limit for the month. Um, so that works well for people who are. They just want an audiobook. They've got a really nice selection of audiobooks, which we've talked about as being, you know, those downloadable audiobooks as being more important. Yeah. Um, they have a good selection of audiobooks, and you can have it now. You don't have to wait for your neighbor to return it before you. Yeah, it's nice. It. So yeah. um, the two services together actually complement quite well. You know, the, maybe you don't get uh, the most popular book right away, but they've got um, certainly some popular materials, but then it's, uh, it's something that you can have right now. So I support it. Okay. Yep. Do you need to vote on that or? or? I don't think so. I just okay. want to make sure we have your consensus on that. If that feels like a good idea, um, you know. Yep. I'm here. I'm seeing head nods. So. Okay. I don't hear anybody going like, what are you doing? Okay, great. Thank you. That's okay. awesome. Yep. And five rivers. Okay. So this is sort of a conceptual question. I've included a quote in here. Um, for, for this. So we have been asked by Five Rivers. Uh, they have installed a new outdoor classroom at Five Rivers. And uh, during that project there, they would like us to be able to extend our internet access that we currently provide at the main building at Five Rivers. They would like us to be able to extend that uh, Wi-Fi out to that new construction. Um, it unfortunately involves uh, quite a bit of trenching which is expensive. When you have to trench in the ground and lay cable, um, that's an expensive proposition. So even beyond the price of the equipment, which we totally accept as part of our uh, service that we provide to the public, um, there is an expense. I have pursued uh, with our elected officials. I think this is something because it's a partnership between DEC and the library, it seems very grantable uh, with our elected officials under whatever the program uh, de jour is called down there. So I think this has a pretty good chance of getting funded. My question is, uh, you know, people from Five Rivers want to have an answer. I, I am perfectly happy to have the answer be, um, hey, this is something we're interested in pursuing. If we can get funding from the elected officials, we will uh, move on it. Or is this something that we, you know, $8,000 is, is, is a chunk. Uh, is that something we want to move on now on the speculation that the money would come in from our elected officials at some point? I'm in the category of let's conditionally say, okay, but I would want to get it reimbursed or get it funded by the elected officials. I mean, it seems like the state of New York can pay for $8,000, you know, they have a larger tax base than we do, but, right. but if, you know, um, be nice to have the service there, but it, um, I think that's, that's an ultimate Pat Fahey member item or something. Yeah. Who are we really benefiting out there? When you say the period of construction, we're not talking about the construction workers. No, 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 no. So sorry, they've built this. So the thing exists. It's a, it's, it's a little bit unfortunate that it wasn't part of the construction. Um, it's, it's, we're doing it after the fact. That's just, that's the way it happened. Um, but no, it's, it, there's an outdoor classroom and they would like to be able to support 
uh, have Wi-Fi to enhance their uh, educational offerings for the outdoor classroom. It's absolutely a no-brainer. To have the, have the Wi-Fi there is something I want to do desperately um, to support that educational mission of Five Rivers. It's just the, the one-time costs of, the, of the, um, the laying the cable, that's, that's the expense. I, I agree. Uh, yeah, this, this was a, a dropped ball by somebody in the cost of the construction and the budget. And it really should have been included. So I, I don't think ultimately we should be bearing the cost or 50% of the cost or anything. Yeah. I would, I'd probably soften if, <laughs> if push came to shove. But right now, I, I would prefer to have somebody else pick up the tab. Okay, so then I, I just want to have an answer for them. So my answer is, you know, uh, we're just going to wait till we can get funding for the for the physical construction. You know, the library pays for the ongoing cost of the Wi-Fi, and we pay for the equipment, yeah. the Wi-Fi equipment. But that's that's where we are. I just wanted to make sure we were there. Um, you know, how desperately we were interested in getting that out there. Charmaine, did you have a question yeah. for me? Yeah, I just have a question, and maybe I'm just not understanding. Why don't they apply for a grant for it? Uh, right. They, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was not okay. understanding. I, you know, I don't know. I, I have no idea about the the, okay. the okay. construction budget to see if they have eight thousand dollars left. Maybe. Exactly. I'll, so I will that that will be our answer. And if they can come up with the money, that would be great. It's I know that there are difficulties with some um, with the state to provide the actual internet service. It is much easier for the library to do that. Okay. Sort of from lots of political and practical reasons, it's easier. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's our mission. I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't support it, but I also think, like like I think Mary and Mark are saying, let's explore some other alternatives, some sharing or, or other sources before we commit. We'll do. Right now. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I just wanted to be sure where we were. So thank you. I appreciate that. I just okay, got other, Yeah, go ahead, Mary. There's one other thing on that. We have done this type of thing in other areas. Yep. I feel like this is crossing a line. I do too. I feel like this could potentially be crossing a line that I don't believe we want to cross. And I, I'm just making that point as far as ammunition for you going back as to why we don't want to yeah. do it. Got it. Thank you. Understood. Yep. If we're going to spend eight grand, I'd spend it on another something else. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what it's a, it's a yeah. chunk of the IT budget, right? That's a, right. that's a, you know, I need yeah. new laptops too. So. Right. Okay, that's good. Um, other new business, I have one item, but- You might have the same item as me, but go ahead. Okay, nominations committee. Yeah, we need to do a nominations committee for upcoming upcoming year. Um, so I'm looking for board volunteers on that. Or to people to think about that and get back to me um, or to Jeff on that. Need to I'd, be willing, I'd be willing to do it, but I'm the newest member, so I'm, I'm kind of defer to other people's expertise and years of experience. But, but so, so if you need a body, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to see if you have, get the numbers, and if not, I'd be glad to jump in, but I, I just don't think I'm the best or most knowledgeable person to do it. Okay. Helpful. Okay, people can think about that and um, get back to Jeff or myself. Um, I don't really want to give it to Harmeet since he's the one not here, so... But uh, but uh, uh, without talking to him first. Um, but yeah, that you know that would be that would be great. Um, any other new business? Okay, old business, long range steering committee. There's not much to update really. There um, isn't. I just wanted to. I included the draft services plan right in the packet. Um, it right. doesn't. This isn't for discussion for tonight. I mean, I'm happy to discuss it, but it's not what it's there for. I wanted to put this into the full board's hands. This is um, our the the sort of staff side with guidance from the community members' input and all of our surveys. Um, this is uh, where we see the long range services plan going, and and you know this long range service long range planning process has because we hired a consultant necessarily focused much on the building, but sort of co-equal to that, or maybe of sub, sub, you know, greater importance is the services plan, right? The services plan uh, touches right. in certain places, but it's also very important. Um, this is where uh, you as elected officials tell uh, the staff and the library, we talk about where we're going, you know, we can't focus on everything. We'd love to be able to do absolutely everything, but what can, you know, what are the three, four, five things that we can identify that we need to push on for the next three years um, from a services standpoint? And certainly the building impacts the services of the library, 
but at the same time, um, you know, where we thought we were going to go with the long range plan uh, pre COVID, which is the last time, you know, we, we, we had this plan uh, geared up and ready to go major revamp. We had to, to pull a lot of that stuff back. Some of the stuff that we were interested in doing, you know, fishing licenses and whatever gone, we've got some um, sort of core things. The world has changed from, from there. We have some core things and this is our best thought about where we need to head. But what I need is your best thoughts about what you think about this or other areas where you think we need to be focused that I, that we didn't identify. I need, um, I need your input on that because this is really the document that expresses the community's will through you as board members about where the library's um, headed. Not from like, are we gonna be checking out books? Of course, we're gonna be checking out books. What are those larger goals that the library is gonna set for itself um, in the coming years and what do we need to be focused on? And there's, there's money tied to this. There's staff people tied to this. There's money, um, there are programs and services and um, political consequences. So we wanna make sure that, um, that you're there and you're comfortable with it. I just wanted to make sure, just give it out to the full board, make sure you have it. I don't wanna surprise anybody with it. So sorry about the diatribe, but that's where we are right now. And I just, um, you know, I, 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 I like this, but I want you to have it. And I am very, very, very interested in your input. Yeah, and I just want to amplify that this is a this is this is the uh, uh, the long range plan in my in my estimation the, the building all that kind of comes with it. But this people should look really carefully and see if they're comfortable with what's in the document or if you have, there's questions or whatever. I think uh, it's a great piece to start, but I think you know we should we should really look at that carefully. Yeah, because I I've been given its length and the detail. Could we maybe discuss it next? And maybe people give additional feedback next. At next meet. I mean, people can always email back and forth, but yes. give us a month to just really go through it. And that's, oh, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's exactly why you have it. And next month, you know, we're, we're the plan is to have Paul Mays come in and do the you know, really have a major discussion about the facilities plan. It may not even be that our just you know, that's having a services plan and a facilities plan discussion, uh, maybe, but also may take hours. So it might be that that's the August meeting, but it's um, okay. you know, yeah. absolutely just wanted to make sure you had this document. You could see where um, you know my brain was, and you could know um, you know where we are, and I you know we can figure out together um, where we're going. So, mute myself. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to say I did have the chance to look over it when you distributed the board packet. I thought it was very thorough. Um, the only thing I didn't see that I thought we had talked about, and maybe you made a decision which would be fine, but um, was the possibility of adding passport services to the library? Was that right. just off the table? It was, I have to say that's, uh, we talked about it and, and um, you know, it's not my final decision. So, you know, if, if, if that's something we want to pursue, we had a lot of things. We had sort of CDTA bus passes, fishing licenses, passport services, uh, enhanced notary service. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we know there's expenses involved with all of those um, and we, pull, we did pull back from that, but that is exactly the kind of thing that I want us to discuss. So if that's okay. an important a service that we want to provide, it, it's absolutely possible for us to do that and we can pursue it. I just, um, you know, right. our thought, we, we pulled it out of the last time we talked about the plan, but it does not mean it's not there. Uh, it okay. doesn't mean it can't be there. So. Well, I know some staff had um, good reason to feel like it would be an onerous um, program to add. So, so. Yeah. It's, it definitely takes staff time. And I think, um, you know, we're saying, you know, there are some some pretty ambitious uh, sustainability goals. Again, we have to say, is that something we want to commit to? There are, um, you know, some some EDI goals in there. Uh, are, are, you know, is that where we're going to put our energy? Um, this plan, even as it sits, may be too ambitious, um, but that's why I want to I, I want to talk about it. I don't want to uh, we want to swing for the fence. I'd rather swing for the fence and not make it than 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 underestimate that. So I I yeah. um, I welcome that exact feedback, please. Uh, let's let's have a good meaty discussion about that. Yeah, sorry, it's, a ahead, form, it's a different you know time, right? I mean, we're post pandemic, so it's a different time. So, uh, you know, Jeff and I talked earlier about putting it out, but it's it, maybe you should think about like, okay, so what do we think the next couple of years are going to? What services could we offer, or, or what what more could we do, or what do we get rid of? Frankly, that's another part of it. You know. Really, the Jeff, hard part. 
Yeah, Jeff, when you, when you were just talking, did you say the word like? I thought I heard you say the word license. And I'm not sure what that. You're talking about driver's license? Uh, fishing license. Sorry. Oh, One fishing. Of the was, uh, you know, yeah. I thought it was driving license. And I'm like, oh, oh my man. gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. These are, yeah. these are all things that are offered by libraries in our local area and seem to be yeah. popular. So it's just, you know, is this something we want to get into? So, yep. Mary? Um. I, I looked at the document um, and I thought it was extremely comprehensive and, and well thought out. It was very impressive. Um, the one thing that I would like to um, ask people to think about is um, the time to discuss these things. The um, July board meeting already has um, a number of other things. I'm just throwing it out. Um, do people want to do a couple long meetings? Do we want to say, we're, we're going we're gonna to do it in July? We're going to stay here till nine or nine thirty. You know, do people have preferences when they want to do a long meeting, or do you want to wait and see what you might want to put together for an agenda and get an idea? Because I think some of these things could run long. Right. We also could do another meeting. We could do another. You know, we're not. We're not. It doesn't have to be the monthly schedule. So. So I, I also think it's important that you know, given vacation schedules and all the rest. Um, I, I think for something as major as the, the long range plan, whether it's on services or facilities, um, if at all possible, a full board should be available. And so for the services plan, um, if the full board, for example, can't be together in July, then perhaps either scheduling a, a separate meeting or, or pushing that to August to get feedback, so. Yeah, that's my sense too, is that, um... We should do it in August or September, actually. You bet. Yeah. I know Mark and I had a discussion about this, and I just, uh, we, you know, we all agree that the board likes to have the information there um, for everybody to mull and contemplate, and I just wanted to make sure you had it available to you um, for those purposes. So thank you. Okay, other old business. Um, is this, I'm not sure where this fits in, but the idea of fines. The fine policy. Um, I think Carmeet maybe raised it at the end of the last meeting about having it sooner as opposed to later. I, I'm, I may be misremembering that incorrect or in remembering that incorrectly, but um, and I'm not sure where it fits in with long range planning, if at all. But um, perhaps having a discussion, and I'm, I'm not sure if that will lead to a, a decision on a sort of semi permanent policy or, or approach. Throw that out. I think the long range, the services plan is exactly the kind of place that that discussion, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, it's complicated. And that's where, um, that's where that discussion can, ha can happen. So. Although we did decide that we were going to go back to collecting funds. That's, as it's, July 1. It, that, it's on the rails. So that's, that's okay. happening. Right. So, so we would be talking about changing a policy on fines. That, that was my recollection. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, my, my sense is that that's a long range planning service uh, discussion item. We should, um, you know, talk about it. We've talked, I've talked about it in a couple of different iterations of the boards that I've been on here, but we should try to figure out what the problem, what, what, what are we trying to address, uh, you know, with a change in policy and whether we have the data to be able to uh, deal with that. And we, then, you know, and then, right. and then think about, okay, we can have a section on fines, um, you know, or, or lack of thereof or access issues or in general. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a lot of data about fines, again, because we have done in the past year, just about every iteration of this right. um, in the past, call it two years. Mm -hmm. We have a bunch of good data, and I know Catherine um, has been assembling that, and and we're ready to present it. It just you know we need a we need a space and a time to have those discussions and present that data so that we can have a good discussion about that. So, I have to say that I it has long range implications. I don't see it in the same necessarily pot as the long range plan. You're talking about fines. There, there's a philosophical side to it. You're talking mm -hmm. about a roughly twenty-eight or thirty thousand dollar revenue line in the budget. Um, it's not a huge piece of the budget, and um, considering 
how lengthy some of these discussions are going to be on the long range plan and the services plan. I, I would suggest that this might be something we could hold off and discuss after the fact. Whatever decision we make, on this topic, I don't think it's going to change any of our other decisions for the long range plan. So I think it could clearly be carved out and, and put off to the side. It does not mean that I don't think it's an important topic. I just would hate to get tied up in that with its own unique philosophies. It's something to consider. Yeah. I was gonna I'm, say. I'm pretty sure that Harmeet was saying, and again, he's not here, but, was saying we should decide before we go back to collect. Wasn't he saying that? He absolutely that was saying that. Right? Before we reinstitute fines, we should decide. So I'm not, again, that's what I recall. I may not, and I'm not sure we can do that. Because when, when do you start collecting fines again? July 1. We're, 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 we're at the meeting, right? So yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. and that's exactly, um, you know, and I, and he was expressing that he was, you know, the, the, the time to talk about that is before we start. I mean, that's, um, well, it's a very poor paraphrase of what he said at the last meeting. Yeah. But that's, um, yeah, but we're we're basically from what my direction from the board right now is we re we reinstitute those on July one. We've communicated that out to the public. Um, that was sort of my biggest thing is if we you know we were re reintroducing fines, I wanted to make sure that everybody had sufficient time to get that information. Kristen's been working at at getting that data out to everybody. I hate surprising people, so um, you know I think we have done that to the best of our ability at this point. But uh, you know, absent further guidance from the board, um, that's where I'm where I'm moving on July 1. I was going to say, I think after having this period of time when we haven't collected fines, you know, we'd kind of be remiss if we didn't have that conversation when we've, we've had this experience. And I think there has been a lot of change. Uh, and Jeff, you know, chime in if you disagree uh, with local libraries and the system, a lot more have moved towards the very few that very much started this slope in this um, community, you know, our area, Upper Hudson. Yes. Um, so, you know, it never hurts to have that conversation and go back to it. I think some of the things that we would think about and, and have concerns are different than perhaps a Brunswick or, you know, Albany and, you know, and they were kind of on the cutting edge of that stuff, but for very different reasons than I think we probably are thinking about it so right. and i and i appreciate the the having the space to have the discussion because i feel sometimes like um because there has been movement and and lisa i appreciate the upper hudson wide um viewpoint that you're bringing to this because you know when when i i you know i'm sending articles uh, about it and the other local libraries i don't want people to feel that i'm that i'm hurting or cajoling i just want to make sure that i'm presenting information to you um about what's happening in the lighter the wider library world the public libraries going on public libraries nationwide statewide in our local area as well as um you know the data that we've been able to collect some 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 quite comprehensive data from inside the library as well so we'll we'll i think it's worthy of a discussion and i know we've we've had that discussion again i think we have a little bit more information for you um but and you know but I, I think it's it's worthy of having that space. But I, you know, at the same time, I, I sometimes hesitate to always be putting that in there because certainly, um, you know, in my viewpoint from the library world, public libraries are moving away from from having fines be part of their core service business. Uh, but again, are there plenty of libraries in the world that continue to have fines? Absolutely. Um, you know, so so there's a trend that that. Uh, you, it's just a, that's a fact. So, um, so there we are, I, you know. What I might recommend is that since the July one is gonna be the, the physical long range planning one, that that be the focus of that meeting and, and any other peripheral business that has to be done. But um, when the services long range plan is, let's say we do that in August or September at the latest, that um, given that the number one item that you identified is um, social justice and inclusion. If in fact um, those statistics are related or, or, or shed light on how fines either promote or social justice or um, are barriers to social justice and inclusion, then that perhaps um, may be the time to have, if they're tied. And I, I suspect they are, but I don't know, you have the data. So um, that might be a, a time to do that. But I also encourage us to stop, not not kick the can down the road 
too many times, even though it sounds like you're in a time crunch now. And um, so July 1st, go ahead because you've already advertised it, but you know, come, come the fall that, that I would encourage the board to have that discussion and make a decision. Yeah, I would say they are. And again, um, I, I don't want to pre-interpret the data for you. So I'm going to hold off from, um, from giving you more of my, um, my opinions in that mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, it sounds like we need a Jeff. You know, I need to talk scheduling of stuff yep. to make sure we fit can fit all this stuff in. There's but a lot I, of big stuff. I, I get it. So, um, okay. yep, you and I will talk okay. about that. Thanks, Mark. Anyway. Okay. Any other old business or future business you want to talk about? Can I ask one more question about the service plan? Do you sure. ever open that up for public comment? Uh, we absolutely can. We, we, we sought out public opinion when we were putting it together. Um, there's no reason that we couldn't put that out for, for public comment as well. We tend to get, my opinion now, we tend to get better results from asking, um, you know, from like survey results. Uh, you know, we, we did um, several, feel so pre-COVID now, but like sort of the, the dot exercise that happened in the library where we were asking people what you know, was their most important services in the library. Um, but it absolutely is available and it's a public document now. So um, you right. know, the incidental public comment can happen, but we could formally put it out for public comment as well. Yeah, I'm not suggesting you, I, it was just uh, something that popped in my mind. It's like, that's a lot to lay on. The, well, it's part of our responsibilities, I guess, as trustees, but um, if it's covering the direction of services for the next three to X number of years, you know, I was just curious, you know, if, if you wanted to suggest that the public, you know, Co you know, comment on it or give feedback on it or present it much like the budget summary right. that um, at the end, the end of the, right before the budget vote. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. And, and we don't have to decide today. I just was, it just dawned on me that maybe the public would want to know. And I, I welcome, I welcome the public's input on it. I think we all might be a little bit surprised about the lack of public comment when we tend to put stuff like that out. I, you know, yeah. I really, um, yeah, I, I, I want it. I'm desperate for it. So, um, you know, I'm happy to include that just as long as we were prepared for the response. Okay, speaking of the public, do we have any public participation? Just checking right now. Mm -hmm. I uh, do not see anything new. Before we move to that, uh, my old message is that capital uh, it should... Uh, where, if, when, and where would the board discuss establishing a, a, an additional fund? Pros, cons, whether we want to do it or not. I mean, have we had that discussion or are we, is that more open? -ended? I want to have a conversation with the auditors <clears throat> about that. Okay. I want to make sure that my thinking is right on it, that, that it's something that we can easily do and there's no Accounting rules that prevent us from doing something doing that easily, back and forth. You know, we want to add to it, we want to take away from it. I just want to get a better understanding of it of it from an accounting standpoint. So hopefully I'll have some information at the next board meeting, or we can put it off if the next board meeting is too long. Yeah. I think it should go to the finance committee first with what you have, Sherry, and, uh -huh. and you know, we would yeah. At least review it and maybe maybe you know re review your recommendation before you bring it to the board. I think that's the way it yeah. should go. Yeah, right. And it makes good sense. Yeah, and we could. Yeah, I, I agree. We should. That should be a finance committee item. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other future business? Uh, old business? Any other? Anyone else want to say anything for the good of the order before we go into executive session? Okay. Um, then we need to move into executive session. What I'll look for is someone to make the motion that is uh, the board adjourned to an executive session at some time to discuss contract negotiations pursuant to Article 14 of civil service law. Okay, can I have that motion from someone? Anyone? <laughs> so moved, whatever he said. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. All those in favor? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Good okay, night, welcome. everyone. Good night. Thank you very much. Right. So, and I'll be asking uh, Tracy and Sherry to stay uh, at this uh, executive session. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Good night, everyone. Good night, Chris. Good night.
All right, let me 